grab your Bibles. I want you to turn. We're going to talk about great sex God's way. We're going to talk about redeeming what it is that God created and taking back from the enemy what he's tried to counterfeit. Look to Proverbs chapter 5, verse 15. Go there. Proverbs 5, verse 15. Speaking of a husband and his wife, or a wife and her husband. Drink water from your own cistern. In other words, stay faithful to the one God's given you in marriage. And fresh water from your own well, should your springs be dispersed abroad, streams of water in the streets, let them be yours alone, not for strangers with you. Let your fountain be blessed. Rejoice in the wife of your youth. Ha! As a loving hind and graceful doe, let her breast satisfy you at all times. Can I just say, I didn't write this. This is the Bible I'm reading to you right now. Don't judge me. Be exhilarated always with her love. Why should you, my son, be exhilarated? Be exhilarated with an adulteress. Embrace the bosom of a foreigner for the ways of a man before the eyes of the Lord. Or before the eyes of the Lord. I mean, no, he watches us. We can run, but we can't hide. He knows us. He watches all his paths. His own iniquities will capture the wicked, and he will be held with the cords of his sin. Well, that's powerful. He will die for lack of instruction in the greatness of his folly. He will go astray. Let's go now to the forbidden book, the Song of Songs, the Song of Solomon. If you read the Song of Solomon and don't blush, then you're not reading the Song of Solomon. I want to read to you Song of Solomon, chapter 7, verse 1. Follow this. Song of Solomon, chapter 7, verse 1. How beautiful are your feet and sandals, O prince's daughter. The curves of your hips are like jewels, the, the work of your hands of an artist. Your, your navel is like a round goblet, which never lacks mixed wine. I'm having a hard time figuring, thinking through that one, wine in my wife's navel. I don't know. For some reason, I'm getting belly button lint mixed with that. So I don't know. Some, you with me, gay? Are, you, are we tracking, gay? You, look at this. Your belly is like a heap of wheat fenced around with lilies. That's a compliment, by the way. Your two breasts are like two fawns, twins of a gazelle. Your neck is like a tower of ivory. I'm not so sure that's very, I guess back then that was complimentary. I mean, I'm thinking that's a long neck right there. <laughs> Your eyes like the pools of Heshbon by the gates of Beth Rebam. Your nose is like the tower of Lebanon. I wouldn't say that one either. Nose, tower of Lebanon, I don't know. But somehow that's, that works, which faces toward Damascus. Your head crowns you like Carmel. Your flowing locks of your head are like purple threads. The king is captivated by your tresses. How beautiful, how delightful you are, my love, with all your charms. Your stature is like a palm tree, and your breasts are like its clusters. I said, I will climb the palm tree. I didn't write this, all right? Come on. How many of you know? Let's climb the palm tree. And your breasts are like its clusters. I said, I will climb the palm tree already. I will do it. It's a tough job, but somebody's got to do it. I will take hold of its fruit stalks. Oh, may your breast be like clusters of the vine, and the fragrance of your breath like apples, and your mouth like the best wine. It goes down smoothly for my beloved, following gently through the lips of those who fall asleep. Y'all know, this passage is a beautiful picture uh, of a spiritual reality. Certainly Solomon and the Shunammite woman. But it's, a, it's even a greater picture of Christ as our bridegroom and the church as the bride. Come on, somebody, you out there? It's what it is. I want to pray. Father, right now I think of this word. Help me, Jesus. <laughs> grace. Give me grace to say what I'm going to say. Thank you for those to hear with the right ears, to hear the right things. Uh, Father, convict us of the things we need to be convicted of. I pray in Jesus' name. You say amen? amen. You can be seated. Bless you, bless you, bless you. Three very important truths. Three very important truths I want to share with you. You've got, should have, you should have one of these. Guys, ushers, if you could quickly be ready. Uh, if you need one of these, right here, wave at me quickly. This should be in your bulletin. 
here, right here, guys. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Right back here. If you need one of these little inserts, our notes you can take notes with. These are really cool. Very good. Right over here. Thank you, Rachel. Up here at the front, we've got about three or four up here. All right, all right, all right. Keep your hand up till you get it. Let's talk about, right here, we still have some folks right up here. Thank you. You guys see these guys right up here over the front, right inside? Good. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Let's talk about this topic of sex. Great sex, God's way. Here's the first point I want to make. Three very important truths. Number one is this. God wants you to have sex. All right? God wants you to have sex. Let me prove it. Genesis 1, verse 28 says, God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Can I just say, just quickly, that's impossible without having sex. That's biology lesson 101 right there, right? Would you agree with me? He says, subdue it, rule over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. I love the NFL. I, I, I'm disgusted with the behavior of these players right now over the national anthem. I'm just, that's where I'm at. Uh, but I still love the NFL. I, and I think what makes the NFL great is there are boundaries, there are certain boundaries for every football game. Really, truthfully, it's the boundaries that enhance the game. You think about it. In the same way, God, how many of you know, has set boundaries for sex? That doesn't mean he's against sex, right? If anything, the boundaries, if you will, enhance the game. Yeah? Okay. Boundaries enhance our sexual experiences. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 3, it says, The husband must fulfill his duty to his wife. And likewise, also the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority of her own body, but the husband does. And the, likewise, also the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. How many of you see in this, there's a mutual respect that has to be in the marriage relationship? Amen? Stop then depriving one another except by agreement for a time so that you may devote yourselves to prayer and come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because you're lack of self-control. I've heard guys, and I'm, I'm going to knock you in the head if I find out who you are, uh, and mostly it's the guys that do this. They love taking that scripture if they don't feel like they're getting enough sex from their wife and beating their wives over the head with that scripture. The Bible says, don't deprive me. Well, you're not reading that scripture real good because that goes both ways. Doofus. <laughs> I was thinking another word, but I didn't say it. Come on, y'all goes both ways but see you see the importance of there being that agreement together that understanding of one another why that is an important thing um, <clears throat> literally I believe when that is not when, when you when your sexual life is not active in marriage I believe that we literally open a door to the enemy believe that it's all in my heart I believe that we give the enemy opportunity to come in on the lack of sexual activity within our marriages and I think we have to work together we have how I many know you got to communicate we've got to talk through these kinds of things I'll get a little more into that in just a minute but I think we need to see it so what are some things that are outside of his boundaries well obviously premarital sex is outside of the boundaries of God's Word would you agree with that not here to be condemning not here. Uh, the Bible says there's no condemnation of those who are in Christ. It's not my job to condemn. Holy Spirit may convict you. My job is to preach the truth, and then we'll let the Holy Spirit kind of sort out the details, bring the conviction where there needs to be conviction. But it's not okay, according to the Word of God, to have sex outside of the boundaries of marriage. That's not okay. It's not okay to live together. It's not I love you if you're living together. I still love you, and I'm glad you're here. And I hope you keep coming. <laughs> yeah? But that's not okay. There are boundaries that God's Word gives us. We can't get outside of those boundaries. Are you with me? It's getting kind of quiet in here. How many of you know adultery outside the boundaries? Huh? Right? Homosexuality, the same thing. Outside of the boundaries of what God's Word says. No more condemnation here again. 
at those that may be struggling with homosexual sin that might even be here today. I love you. I want to I pray this church. I pray we be a church where those that are struggling with homosexual sin will be welcome and feel comfortable to come here and receive God's love. The same for those that come here that struggle struggle with pornography that you feel. The same of those that come here that struggle with anger that, that you would feel welcome to come. Are you out there? But this is outside again the boundaries of God's marriage, the use of porn in the bedroom. I, I no, it's not. That's outside of those boundaries. Are you out there? Now, what are those things that are biblically blessed? That's the question. Well, they are within the boundaries of of what the Word of God says. That brings me to the second point, number two. God wants you to enjoy sex. Say enjoy. enjoy. I'll say it like you mean it. Enjoy. Y'all right there. That's what I was looking for. That was you, Andrew. Well, that's awesome, girl. I love it. Kim and I, early on, before we got married a long time ago, we were given a book by a guy named Dr. Ed Wheat. I don't even know if it's in print anymore. You probably get it. It's called Intended for Pleasure. And it just brought forth this truth that God intended the sexual act for more than just procreation. He intended it for pleasure. Don't you love the creativity of God? God did this. God intended the sexual act for pleasure. He could have maybe made it to where basically you just come together and you rub noses together and somehow in the rubbing of noses you, 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 know, you conceive, ladies. But God didn't do that, right? He had a very different thing in mind. This was God's, it was sex, this thing was God's idea. Yeah? We're so kind of timid to go there and talk about it and, and kind of get, and we blush. We, come on, are you kidding me? If we should talk about it now, it's right here in this setting, in this environment. How many of you would rather your teenagers learn in this environment rather than the middle school bathroom where it's written all over the wall or some kid bringing a pornographic magazine teaching him that way? Come on, parents. I want us to be able to take a godly model in regard to sex and be able to present that to our children. Uh, if you will, a, a very biblically sound, uh, 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 what, what's the word, uh, uh, bees, uh, uh, bees and, birds and bees. I was bees and birds. <laughs> a birds and bees, godly kingdom uh, presentation of godly biblical sex to our children. Come on, y'all. Amen. God intended this for pleasure. God wants you to enjoy sex. If I gave you the opportunity to ask questions this morning, you could probably maybe even do it anom anonymously. I think the, probably the number one question that would be asked is, okay, so what, uh, what's legal within the biblical confines or boundaries of marriage? What's legal? Well, let's just kind of go there, can we? Shall we? We shall. Hebrews 13, 4, here we go. Marriage is to be held honorable among all. And the marriage bed is to be undefiled. For fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. Now, it's interesting in this passage that fornication and adultery are kind of specifically pointed out. Some might even try to use this verse to discourage their spouse from being creative in the marriage bed together. Hello? <laughs> Whew, it's hot in here. Now, a little skit right there. Tarzan. Jane. Me, Tarzan. You, Jane. Let's be creative, shall we? I, a true story. True story. Paul Harvey. How many of you love Paul, Paul Harvey? <laughs> there, was a, there was a true story. Paul Harvey account given... I heard him share this, and he was talking about this lady was at her house, and she was next door, uh, she lived next door to this couple, and, and she heard this blood-curdling scream from the other house. This lady was screaming, and uh, she said, oh my gosh, so she thought somebody, well, something bad, terrible's happening, so she runs next door, knocks on the door, nobody answers, she's 
just goes in because she's afraid what's going on. And she walks up to the bedroom, and there the lady is, handcuffed to the bed, completely naked. And the man, her husband, is laying on the floor with a Batman cape on. The problem was, when he dove for the bed, the, the ceiling fan cold cocked him in the forehead and knocked him out. So let me just, the moral of that story, just in your creativity, watch the ceiling fan. I'm just saying. Sure. I don't know about you, but honestly, the, the missionary position just kind of sounds boring to me a little bit. The reason they, there's a reason why they called it the missionary position. That's what the position the missionaries use. <laughs> I told you to leave your kids. I, told, I warned you. I truly believe. I truly believe this. Now, you can argue with me. You can go there if you want to. That's fine. Again, I think this is the place we ought to be talking about this stuff. I believe there's a case for oral sex in the Song of Solomon. That's just me. I'm saying if you want to argue that with me, go argue with someone else. Don't argue with me about that. I do believe that. All of it has to do with mutual consent, though. Mutual consent. If your wife looks at you and she's like, uh, I don't think so, then you don't need to be like, woman, I'm the priest of this home. Not right now, you ain't being the priest of this home. You're being the pervert of this home right now. <laughs> I just now thought of that on the fly. I think that's kind of funny. <laughs> there better be mutual consent. If there's not mutual consent, then there's something wrong. I, I tell you, I've counseled marriages where I'm telling you where husbands were, were making their wives do things that the wife did not want to do and she did them just to try to make the marriage happy. I'll tell you what, if that's happening here, come see me. I, I'd like to just go talk to your husband because that's evil. It's sick, it's perverted, and it will destroy your marriage. There's boundaries still, amen? But there's creativity within the boundaries. I, I personally, am a fan, I'm a fan of, of, of date nights. I'm talking about date nights. I'm talking about whole nother level date nights. I'm talking about a date night on steroids date night. Are y'all following me so I don't have to get detailed there? Are we good? And I mean, you have like specific times, maybe Tuesday, Thursday. I'm a fan of MWF, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Maybe I'll get lucky on the weekend. I don't know. I'm just saying. But the where, see, how many of you know in life you get very busy? Things get crazy. And you can just kind of get so busy. And, you know, again, the, the little skit proves that. There are things that just happen in life. And if you're not, come on, watch this. See, guys are microwaves. Man, it, the turn on is right there. Women are crock pots. Just take some time. <laughs> Guys are like, woo! Woo, woo, woo! The woman's like, I really have a headache. I'm serious. <laughs> We're clueless, man. I got to admit, 34 years in, I'm still kind of clueless, you know? Oh, gosh, where am I going with all this? <laughs> but see, a date night, you're intentional. Date night, you got it planned. She's kind of thinking ahead. She's kind of got the crock pot turned on very warm. By noon, it goes to medium heat. Hopefully, by the evening, that thing's on hot. Y'all know what I'm saying. Y'all there? I'm breaking every rule in the book today. I warned you people. I warned you. I warned you. I warned you. Listen to me. I think a date night thing is a great idea. I just really do. We need to try that, babe. We should try that out, date nights. We do it. Actually, we, well. (laughs) 
<laughs> what, what I'm, what I'm, what's, my poor children are having to witness this right now. That's what, they're like, you know what, I'm freaking grossed out right now. Seriously, I'm really grossed out that the thought of my parents. Anyway, uh, now I'm about to go somewhere that I don't think no man has ever gone before. I, this is like Star Trek fixing to happen right here. I'm going to go to galaxies far, far and away on what I'm about. I don't know that I've ever, I, maybe with some select folks I've shared this revelation, but I'm fixing to share a revelation with you. And, I, and anyway, we'll see where it goes. Turn to Revelation chapter 19, verse 7. Revelation chapter 19, verse 7. Watch this. Stay with me. I'm, gonna, I'm telling you, you'll never be the same after you hear this today. Verse 7, let us rejoice. And be glad and give the glory to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Again, marriage is a physical picture of a spiritual reality. Can we agree to that? Why does the devil fight so hard to keep us uh, 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 separated or to cause divorce to be the way it is? Why does he work so hard? Because he wants to skew the, the picture of our relationship with God the Father as our bridegroom. We are his bride. Amen? We are. It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, verse 8, bright and clean. For the fine linen is the righteous eyes of the saints. Then he said to me, right, blessed are those who invite or are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And they said to me, these are true words of God. <coughs> then I fell <coughs> at his feet. Can I get some water, babe? Is there some water over there? Then I fell at his feet. Thank you, honey. You sure are cute today. Boom. <coughs> Then I fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, do not do this. I am a fellow servant of yours and your brethren who hold the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Now go to Revelation 21. Watch this. I'm, I'm making a biblical case for my revelation that some of you are going to really scratch your head over in a minute, but that's okay. Look at verse 1. Listen closely. Revelation 21. Then I saw a new heaven and new earth. <clears throat> For the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there is no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready, look at it again, made ready as a bride adorned who, for her husband. Who's the bride? The church. Who's, who's our husband? Jesus. Amen. Ah. Uh, <clears throat> and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men. He will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. He who sits on the throne, behold, I'm making all things new. And he said, Right, for these words are faithful and true. Now, church, can we agree on something here today, right now? Would you agree that God intended that we enjoy the pleasures that come with sex? Let me ask you that question again. Would you agree, can we get on the same page here, that God intended sex for our pleasure? Right? He did. Hey, see, he made us anatomic, ana, anatomic, anatomic? Anatomically, I'm asking my doctor up here on the front row. He made our anatomy such that we would enjoy sex. He made us. We were created in whose image? His image. His idea. Right? So, the way our anatomy works in the sex act is there's this thing called orgasm that happens. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Can we agree, further agree, that having an orgasm then was God's idea and that he created our bodies to experience this? Yes. Don't judge me. Absolutely. That's the word of God. The word says then, see, we're going to get on the same page here. Guys, I believe there's a reason why, I believe this, I, I believe there's a reason why orgasm does not last long. Our bodies literally could not handle the intensity of it. I think we would agree to that. I won't ask you. Just, we'll just moving right along. 
I'm going somewhere. You're like, dear Jesus, where's he going? Wherever he's going, he needs to get there quick. Now watch this. The word says we're the bride of Christ. And that when we're in eternity with him, there will be this amazing wedding dinner, this wedding feast. And what comes after the wedding feast is the consummation. Don't let your mind get dirty here. Just don't. Because that's not the intention of this. There is a consummation of God's church, his bride, with the bridegroom. We good? Revelation 21 says that we'll have a new body. And, and that, that, that we'll need this body because with this body we'll be able to handle then the sheer ecstasy of being with him in that moment. Here's my conclusion, if you will allow me. I believe we'll need a new body when we get to heaven because heaven will be like an eternal orgasm. You guys are great. You're like. <laughs> Is that okay? How can you not agree with the revelation in that right there? It, I don't know about you. When it's time, whew, heaven's going to be awesome. You know, it's that guy. <laughs> it's that guy that died and went to heaven, and St. Peter met him. And, uh, you know, St. Peter said, well, let me give you a quick tour. So he takes him to his mansion, <clears throat> and he's like, he said, this is yours. He said, Are you, what? I mean, what's this going to cost me? It's free. Whoa, you've got to be kidding me, man. So he walks him to across the street. There's this country club. I believe there's going to be a golf course in heaven. This is me. And there's this country club. I mean, it's the most beautiful country club I've ever seen. The, I mean, the clubhouse is amazing. It's just beautiful. He's like, oh, my gosh, what's a membership to this thing cost? Like, it's free. It's all yours. He just kind of shook his head. And he's like, man, you know what? If, if my wife would have quit feeding me brand muffins, I'd have gotten here a lot sooner. How many of you know, if we, I've done, I've done, I, arguably, I bet I've done a thousand funerals. I, I'm serious. I've done a ton of funerals. And I've said this so many times. I thought if we could just get a glimpse of heaven, if we could just even get a little glimpse, we'd be like, what are we hanging on to this mess for? I believe it's going to be like an eternal orgasm. That's just my theory. I believe it's biblical. If you got a problem with it. Go to Chuck Farina's church. <laughs> Third point, finally, we get to go home. Three, God wants you to understand sex. He wants you to understand sex. Three points under that. First, understand his idea of sex. I've already touched on it a bit. Let me say it just a little further. God ordained marriage for a purpose, to solve a human problem. We see it in Genesis 2.18, and God saw that man was what? He was alone. I'll make him a helpmate for him. There's an issue of loneliness, and marriage is a beautiful thing, and sex is a beautiful thing to, to bridge that, that gap, if you will. The enemy certainly has done his best to counterfeit this. We've talked about it. I, I think it's so important, parents, again, to communicate this with your kiddos like I talked about earlier. A lot of negative things out there combating, come on, their understanding of sex. We, we, can, we can help bring in our homes, come on, in our church. Why am I doing this? Why am I going there? I want to bring a positive, uh, godly atmosphere around this very godly topic of sex. Amen? Positive that leads to honest communication. The second thing in your notes there, understanding one another's idea of sex. I've done a lot of premarital counseling. One of the things I do, I've got a great little uh, form I give to each couple. And there are a list of things that I ask them to talk through. Uh, and one of the things, one of the areas they have to talk through is, is each other's understanding of sex. What is it that's your understanding of, of the whole sex act? 
as a woman, as a man, what's your understanding? And we force them to talk about that with each other when they go home. Because, how many of you know, we bring a lot of baggage. We talked about this last week. We bring bags into our marriage, and maybe from past sexual encounters or situations, or God forbid that there was a, a molestation that, te- that took place, you were sexually molested, and you, you have things that affected you. Man, come on. You need to understand each other. You have got to talk through this with each other. I've, I've counseled couples who literally have said, in this entire year, we've had sex one time. How many of you know that, that there's something wrong? There, there needs to be a healing. Something's not right. You know, sex is, is just a beautiful thing. It's part of our marriage. It's the icing on the cake. I don't know about you, but the thing I like most about cake is the icing. <laughs> That's just me. I go for the icing first and foremost. I got this figure that by doing that. Are you out there? See, something's wrong one time in a year or even one time in six months. I'll hear that every once in a while. It's like, oh, no, 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 something's not right. There's something unhealthy. You need to communicate. Amen? Say communicate. communicate. Third and last thing is this. Understand one another's past in relationship to sex. It fits that thing of idea going into that thing of being warped in your mind towards sex, thoughts about it because of things that have happened to you. Um, and maybe you think that because you were sexually promiscuous that God could never forgive you, could never use you, or maybe you're here and, and you, you, you know, you, uh, God forbid, but then there's some of you that have, that have gone through an abortion and, and your heart's broken over that and you think about it often, you think God could never love me for what I did. Or maybe you encouraged your girlfriend or your wife to get an abortion and you think well, God could never love me. But can I say there's something called the blood of Jesus that comes and cleanses and forgives and sets us free for that one that may be struggling with internet pornography and your life is just wrapped up in it. Man, so many wonderful testimonies. Even recently here at Fountain Gate, God's setting men free of internet pornography. Come on, somebody. I'll tell you, I just believe there's a, there's a power in the forgiveness of Jesus that allows us to be able to look at sex the way God wants us to look at sex. Amen? And it not be this per- perverted thing that the enemies made it become. Are y'all out there? I hope this has helped you. I love you. I went there this morning. But my prayer is that there's just some freedom in this for you today. And that there's some liberty that God will bring to your heart. Let me pray over you. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father, for, for just the opportunity to be able to stand in a pulpit in front of a great church and just be honest. Thank you for the freedom this church gives me. God, thank you for those that are here today. Every person in this room, at some level, we've all had things happen that maybe sexually have not been pure or good, and they've affected our view of what your view is of sex, and I'm praying for a healing. Come on, just wherever you are today, whatever it is that might be an issue, whether, you know, and I'm on a heart especially, and we see this in encounters, I'll tell you, more than, we, than I'd like to say, so many young ladies who were sexually molested. And you, it just your view of sex or your ability to relate sexually to your husband was, was, was affected by that, that incident. And, and it's not healthy. And God, I'm just praying today that there would be a healing for those that the enemy came and formed a weapon against them in this area of their life. Not by any doing of their own, not by them giving permission. It happened to them. They were innocent. And God, I pray that there would be a healing even today. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand or stand up or come forward. You know who you are. Right before God in this atmosphere, would you just give him your heart? Would you ask him to just cleanse you, uh, heal you, to bring life and freedom to that area of your life? For those that may be struggling with sexual sin, this is a great point, a great place just to confess that sin to him. The Bible says if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. God, we just give you all these things. I pray, God, would you give us as your people, a kingdom people, the right godly view, your biblical boundary of what sex is all about and why it's such a beautiful thing that you created and gave us as a gift. And I'm just praying that for everyone here today. Just heads bowed, just one last question. I have to ask this, man, just we've had such an amazing week and I've just seen the hand of God on so many that didn't know Christ, but that responded. And I just want to ask, if you're here today and you just say, Pastor, 
I, I realize that the beginning point of my healing has to come by me giving my heart to Jesus. And you just be honest and say, I need today. I've never really ever intentionally given my heart to Christ. But today I want to give my heart to him. And if that's you, then I, I want you just to be very honest with me and just raise your hand and say, today I want to give my heart to Christ. I want to give my heart to Jesus. I want him to be the Lord of my life. Anyone in this room, just raise your hand real high. I don't want to miss you if you're here. Thank you, sir. God bless you. Anyone else? Man, if you're here, I don't want to miss you. It could be that your heart's just beating out of your chest right now. That's just the Holy Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit. One more minute. Anybody else? One more, one more person. Is there anybody else? Just say, Pastor, I need to give my heart to Jesus today. Hallelujah. Praise God. I know one for sure raised your hand, and I, uh, I, I want us to keep our heads bowed, but I want us all to pray this prayer together. I want us to pray this prayer together. Would you pray this with me, especially for the one that just raised your hand? Would you pray this? Say, Lord Jesus, I ask you today to come into my heart. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. Set me free. I want to be your disciple. I want to follow you all the days of my life. I want you to be in charge of my life. I'm tired of being in charge of my life. I'm ready for you to be in charge of my life. In Jesus' name. Can you say amen? Come on, somebody. Let's give the Lord praise. <laughs> Hallelujah. I know one made a decision that you should have been given a card, and then on that card, just fill that out for me right at the end of the service. Pastor Sean is going to be right through these double doors. Man, we got a cool packet of some great stuff for you. There's a next step. There's some next steps that you need to follow. So make sure you get to Pastor Sean. You guys that are guests with us today, hey, uh, you came on a great day today. <laughs> I would love to meet you. I had a guy in first service came through. He said, well, that was interesting. <laughs> said, well, this is your first time to come? Yeah, that was really interesting. <laughs> I'm like, well, I'm glad you come. I hope you'll come back. He said, you know what? I think I will. <laughs> I love it. So if you're a guest, come see me. I'll be back at this blue VIP table. I've got a gift for you, so please don't rush off. I want to meet you. Man, we're going to have guys here praying. I think we've touched on a lot of things today. There may be some of you that just need to kind of seal the deal. Our prayer team's going to be here. They'd love to just pray over you, minister you, love on you. What's, th what's said here will stay here. That's the confidentiality that's here, and we want you just to feel free to come and do that. It's going to be a great day. Got a lot going on. Encounter Weekend's coming up. Come on, somebody. It's going to be awesome. You've never been to one. You want to go. You don't want to miss it. I'm just telling you straight up. They're amazing. Also, hey, uh, Financial Peace University's going on. Man, we've got, we just got a lot happening at Fountain. If you're not in a life group, get, a life, get in a life group. Call our offices. Come see us. We'll help you get plugged in. Stand on your feet. We're going to go up and shout out hallelujah. Praise God. Is the Cowboys playing today? What time? How many of you know the Cowboys need prayer? <laughs> that was good. Rachel said, they're going to be on TV, but I'm not sure they're going to be playing. I see how it's fair. <laughs> Count of three, let's shout hallelujah. Here we go. One, two, three. Hallelujah. Hey, by the way, by the way, by the way, my granddaughter is here for the first time. Cove is here, and I welcome her. She's beautiful. Don't be coming over and trying to grab a hold of her. Just come and just look and gaze at her beauty. Uh, welcome, Cove, to church. Papa loves you. All right, you're dismissed. Have a great day. See you all later.